This week, Parashat Kitavo marks the end of many chapters of laws the Israelites must observe when they finally enter into the promised land. Just five more portions left to read in the scroll. Our biblical ancestors are nearing the end of their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. In this week's Torah portion, Moses reminds the people, you have seen all that God did before your very eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh and to his courtiers and to his entire country. Therefore, observe faithfully all the terms of this covenant, Moses warns. But if you do not obey God, curses shall come upon you and take effect. This portion has troubled generations of commentators. As one modern theologian reflects, after a relatively brief evocation of the good fortune that awaits Israel, should it obey God's laws, Parashat Kitavo goes to great lengths to describe the disasters that will befall the people should they disobey. The longer and more graphic section depicting the curses begs the question, why would Judaism welcome an observance that's rooted in fear. For the Hebrew speakers among us, you know that there is more that we need to unpack before we can answer that question. You see, the Hebrew word yira is often translated as fear, but in fact, it has wide range of meanings. Something described as nora, for example, from the same root letters as yira, can be either terror instilling or awe inspiring. Indeed, yira can mean both fear and awe. These two seemingly opposite emotions are linguistically connected and also experienced similarly in our bodies. In his book, When All You've Ever Wanted Isn't Enough, by Rabbi Harold Kushner. He writes about the relationship between awe and fear in our minds. Kushner teaches, the feeling of awe is similar to fear in some ways. We feel a sense of being overwhelmed, of confronting someone or something much more powerful than ourselves. But awe is a positive feeling, an expansive one. Where fear makes us want to run away, awe makes us want to draw closer, even as we hesitate to get too close. Instead of resenting our own smallness or weakness, we stand open-mouthed in appreciation of something greater than ourselves. To stand at the edge of a deep cliff and to look down, well, that's experiencing fear. We want to get out of that situation as quickly and as safely as we can. To stand securely on a mountaintop, though, and to look out, that's to feel awe. And we can linger there forever. When our Torah portion this week speaks of the curses that will befall the people in the promised land should they disobey God, it is, in fact, motivating through fear. But being learned Jews with an appreciation for the beauty of biblical Hebrew, we can take the portion as an invitation to transform that paralyzing fear to the other type of yira in Jewish tradition, awe, fear's more productive counterpart. Whereas fear paralyzes us, awe provokes us to act. Many commentators agree that the lower yira, or fear, is far from the ideal. Where serving God is concerned, awe utterly outranks fear. That spiritual exercise is not only work for the wandering Israelites before entering the promised land, but it is the sole work that this Hebrew month of Elul, leading up to these days of awe before us, invites us to do. Tomorrow evening, we'll come together right here in this space, weather permitting, 
for slichot. The slichot rituals have developed over time, but the spirit of the holiday has remained since the beginning. The holiday alerts us to the musical and liturgical changes of these days of awe, marking a turning point in the year, offering space for connection, transition, and teshuva. Consider one of the first mentions of slichot in rabbinic tradition. We're offered a story about the great King David. Tradition teaches that David rightfully feared that the temple in Jerusalem would one day be destroyed and the sacrificial cult nullified. This troubled David greatly. How will Israel make atonement, he wondered. So God said to David, When troubles come upon Israel, let them stand before me together as a single unit and say the slichot, forgiveness service, before me, and I will answer them. That image is striking, isn't it? According to the Midrash, our ancestors were to seek teshuva by standing before God, but agudat achat, together as one spiritual unit offering their slichot prayers together in community. After wrestling with this this text this week, I want to suggest that it's community that is the catalyst for us to cultivate awe in our own lives, helping us climb higher and higher to holiness. Literally, it is being together in community that allows us to transform our fear into more productive awe. As our favorite Rabbi Alan Liu teaches, we are able to find the courage to do this soul work this season precisely because we gather in one single spiritual unit. Precisely because we now realize that the whole enterprise doesn't depend on our single, puny, thin, pale stratagems, but on the belonging to something much larger and deeper and thicker than that. I think that's why Moses phrases his farewell address to his people that we read in this week's Torah portion using singular verbs. But if you do not obey me, he says to the singular people Israel standing before him. Not necessarily to scare the Israelites, although fear does sometimes motivate, but rather inviting them to act. To do what God demands is easier and more meaningful when we do it in community. And according to the Midrash, that's what God wants of us too. Slichot and these days of awe invite us to do this work with awesome, majestic music and messages that sometimes send quivers down our backs. The high holy days invite us to look deep inside ourselves, but also out into the faces of those around us, acknowledging that we are all connected. Together, we are commanded to march towards our proverbial promised land. Better people and a better community than we were last year. Surely that kind of work can be terrifying and awesome as we imagine what is possible for us, for our community, and for the whole world. Shabbat Shalom.